So welcome back to Third Age Reforged and for something a little bit different because it has been a few days, maybe even closer to a week actually, that I've been unable to record anything. So to ease back into the swing of things, uh, to try and get some form of regular content up and running again before YouTube's algorithm decides that my channel is no longer worth keeping around, uh, we're going to be making a bit of a return to the Top 10 series that has been on ice for quite a long time now. Uh, but this one is going to be a bit more of a subjective list because it's going to be my top 10 favourite units in patch 0.97. I feel as though 0.97 has been around for enough time now that everyone has managed to sort of really get their teeth into it and sort of figure out what's what. So this is not a top 10 units overall. That would be quite difficult to ascertain, to be honest with you, based on all the different types of units. And certainly even on this list, there are going to be some units for which... I could probably name a few alternatives which would technically be better, um, but for reasons that I will explain for each one, of course, I'll be explaining why I really do rate these units quite highly. Um, interestingly enough as well, there is only there is no faction that has two entrants on this list. There's only uh, any faction that has managed to get a unit onto this list only has the one, uh, so it should be a pretty good spread. There's all different kinds of units as well, from archers to chariots to line infantry to knights, even artillery. Um, so we'll jump right in, I think, at number 10. So coming in at number 10, we have a unit of upper mid-tier line infantry from the Kingdom of Arthurdane, and that is the Dunedine Peacekeepers. Their little picture there may still be their old variant, which used spears, but they now use a one-handed axe as well as a round shield in combat. And there are probably better unit. well, I know there are better units of line infantry than the Dunedain Peacekeepers in the game. Of course, the Elven factions tend to have some very nasty units of line infantry, as well as some of the other kingdoms of men. Uh, the Romena Abarim, for example, are pound for pound probably better, just because they have the armour that you associate with Numenor, as well as still having a very high attack. However, the reason I like the Dunedain Peacekeepers is for a few reasons. Partially, it's because they tend to weave their way quite well into the Arthur Dane front line. Arthur Dane, unlike a lot of the other factions I just mentioned, have more of an emphasis on building a balanced army, so they can build in some lower tier units into their lines as well, which of course you can then support with some of their Dunedain. That relationship between their standard human units and their Dunedain is one of the key defining factors to Arthur Dane. And something they always struggled with, I think, in 0.96.1 in particular, is everyone always would gravitate towards that very cheap Arthur Dane phalanx for the front line, which you can still do. But the problem with that, of course, was it didn't do a lot of damage very quickly. You'd definitely be reliant on your pikemen doing the damage over a long period of time. That is no longer the case with Arthur Dane, and no longer will they just have to rely on the dismounted Fornost Arrain Knights to do some damage on foot relatively quickly. Because, of course, as an axe-wielding line infantry unit, the Dunedain Peacekeepers have a much higher emphasis on their attack, which is 14. Very high for a unit of line infantry. I think only the Romena Abarim can boast that. And not only that, but usually what lets down an axe and shield unit is their defence. That is not the case with the Dunedain Peacekeepers, however, because their Dunedain nature means that not only do they have decent defensive skill, but you can also upgrade their armour ones, which I don't actually think makes a great deal of difference to their unit model. I think, actually, um, it's the unupgraded model, which is the wrong one here. I think that it's supposed to look exactly like it does in the picture there, with the sort of the classic Dunedain leathers and chains, and this sort of plated version is meant to be the upgraded one. Um, but nonetheless, having that means that you can raise their total defence to a maximum of 22, which is very, very nice, of course. What does slightly let them down, obviously, is the lower man count in a unit of this type, but that's really the same sort of problem that any unit that is this expensive and is of this type has. Um, and honestly, at 750, that's not a bad base um, recruitment cost that they have. They don't have anything special like buffing morale of nearby units like a lot of the other Dunedai have, which is maybe a little bit of a mark against them. But also, just in general, I've noticed in 0.97, these guys perform really, really well against lower tier units. They will absolutely rip them to shreds. Most of the time on kill count screens where I've seen Arthur Dane play and they have brought the Peacekeepers, they have always pulled their weight in terms of their kills. There are weaknesses to bringing this kind of unit, of course there are, but they do tend to marry quite well into the lower tier units of Arthur Dane as well to perform a very balanced role on that front line. Um, but without further ado, I think we should move on to number 9. So coming in at number 9, we have a unit of Spear-Javelin hybrids from Rudar, and I am of course talking about the Etten Moors Trollhunters, which were not a new addition. You know, they are pretty much exactly the same as they were in 0.96.1. 
with the addition, of course, of the spear buffs that were introduced in 0.97 to make spears a little bit more deadly against cavalry, and that, of course, only helps units like the Etten Moors Troll Hunters. And I feel as though I've already said in the past several times why I like the Etten Moors Troll Hunters so much. It's because they can perform such a good role, primarily for, of course, zoning out cavalry from charging into the rear of your quite fragile infantry forces. It's not as if Rude Hour lack for spears or pikes, but. Obviously, a well-placed cavalry charge can play havoc with the morale of factions like Rudauer, even with their heightened morale that their hatred gives them. Uh, but the Etten Stroll Hunters, of course, are fantastic against cavalry because javelins, with their armor-piercing nature and high missile damage as well, are going to be able to do a lot of damage. A missile attack of 9 is also very good. It tends to be that the missile attack of around 9 or 10 and upwards tends to be where you see the javelins do a lot of damage very quickly. Uh, the Atten Walls Troll Hunters are on the lower end of that, but they can still, of course, do a ton of damage to any cavalry or high-profile infantry that gets a little bit too close. And then adding to that, of course, you know, cavalry is not one of, you know, cavalry could want to try and risk charging into regular javelins, uh, just because, you know, with the charge they could carry through and destroy a lot of them. Um, but against the Atten Walls Troll Hunters, that is going to be much less the case, because if they do end up charging into them, they can give as good as they get in melee. In addition to that, of course, uh, they have pretty decent armor as far as Rudar goes. An armor value of 8 is very good for Rudar. You know, one of their faction deficits in many ways is the fact that many of their units don't really have a great deal of armor. Um, it's not something the Etten Walls Troll Hunters has to worry, have to worry about too much. They also have a good shield value in addition to that, so archers are not going to be able to take them out quickly, um, which of course is a problem for some javelins, but the Etten Walls Troll Hunters, even under arrow fire, can get set and deliver a pretty decisive blow should you decide to try and be a little bit more risk-taking with them, we shall say. Uh, it says they can also make shield wall, of course, but that, of course, you know, entails that you will need to be out of ammunition, because uh, obviously there's not really a great deal of point in putting yourself into shield wall while you're still firing away with your javelins. Um, expert hiding in woods is another little thing that most of Rudau's units, to be fair, can do. They can't hide anywhere like some of Rudau's other hand-thrown projectile units, but I feel as though the fact that they make up for Rudau's deficiencies in several areas, to be honest with you, really does make the glue that uh, holds most of the Rudauer uh, faction together um, in terms of most of their compositions. It's quite rare, I think, that you'll see Rudauer go into battle, especially on an open field where cavalry is likely to be a factor it's very rare, I think, that you'll see Rudar go into battle without the Etten Walls Troll Hunters. It, of course, can be done, um, but they're so good um, at what they do that, uh, for the most part, it's, it's a pretty safe bet that you'll see them. They're fairly expensive, of course, but any javelin, really, is able to deliver the punch that the Etten Walls Troll Hunters can deliver, as well as being not half bad in melee. They, of course, won't be able to kill too much uh, in the way of infantry because of the spear malices and the fact that it's not really their forte, but they can still at least muck in. They won't get completely destroyed um, and, you know, their survivability with their armor could be the uh, the difference between victory and defeat in those really close games as well. So there really is a lot going for the Atten Walls Troll Hunters, and Rudauer is a faction and one that I really do like. Um, so it's quite high praise indeed that the Atten Walls Troll Hunters can still sort of rise to the top uh, in uh, in their faction, I think. But now we'll move on to number eight. So coming in at number eight, we have the Brotherhood of the Wayne from Karnd. Now this, of course, is a chariot unit, which I've gone on record in the past for saying that. Uh, I'm not necessarily the best with chariot units, because if you get them bogged down, they can die off very, very quickly, especially if you charge them into pikes or even spears. You know, obviously pikes are like kryptonite if the if the uh, chariots get stopped and wedged within them. There is, of course, the additional weakness chariots have of being technically classed as elephants in the game files, which means any javelin unit with the thrown projectile trait uh, will be able to kill them instantly, pretty much. It will be a hard counter, so higher tier javelins like the Demons of the Desert Metacelled Guard or Ferodrum Javelins are going to be able to absolutely devastate chariots, not just the Brotherhood of the Wayne. Uh, but I have had some joy with the Brotherhood of the Wayne in 0.97, so there are a few reasons why I prefer the Brotherhood of the Wayne to the other options on the table. The first is the fact that, you know, I like the fact that they utilize crossbows. You know, it's a useful projectile, probably not quite as good as the javelins that the Mithlond nobles from Linden utilize, but it is still very nice nonetheless, exactly the same as the Ironfoot Chariots from Erebor utilize. However, the main reason why I prefer the Brotherhood of the Wayne to the other Chariots, we can have a look at all the stats really, but you know, with regards to Chariots, the most important ones are of course the fact they have four hit points and the fact that their mass is such they can crash through enemy lines and just disrupt everything. Uh, their stats overall, other than perhaps missile attack as well, um, are not terribly relevant to what they actually do, because if they do get stopped and that's when their stats really start to come into play, 
That's not really where you want them at all. The difference between the Brotherhood of the Wayne and the other chariots is simply the amount of them in the unit. They have a bigger unit size, which of course means losing one or two of your chariots is not necessarily the end of the world. There's a little bit more margin for error with the Brotherhood of the Wayne. And of course, this just means that they're going to be a factor for longer in the battle, because you know, over a longer period of time, as you start to slowly lose chariot by chariot, the others, you know, the other factions, the other chariot factions, they're going to lose their units before the Brotherhood of the Wayne peter out. And it can be a really frustrating experience to be on the other end of the Brotherhood of the Wayne if you're up against a player who knows how to use them, uh, because they are very, very difficult to stop in general. Um, obviously, if you have the hard counters to them, it's not so much of a problem, and that is worth considering when you're picking your army. Um, but for me, the Brotherhood of the Wayne, just because they're the most user-friendly of the chariots with those additional unit models, that's enough for me to instantly make them the top. But of course, they do have some other things going for them. You know, 1250 is expensive, don't get me wrong, but you could certainly do a lot worse for a unit which can do such a high amount, cause such a high level of disruption in the enemy ranks. Uh, but other than that, um, it really is as simple as that. Obviously, they can frighten nearby enemies. It says special attack, but of course, that's the uh, the nature of chariots in general. Yeah, I, I really do rate the Brotherhood of the Wayne. They give Khan a certain level of punch, I suppose, because it Khan's problem could be said that you can keep them at arm's length for quite a while if you just sort of spread a bunch of your archers out and you sort of make sure that they can't charge you with their cavalry. Um... But the chariots make it a little bit more difficult, because if, if your chariots do get in and amongst the enemy army, it can be a nightmare once they really get up to speed. So yeah, the Brotherhood of the Wayne tying down at the number 8 spot. But I think it's about time that we moved on to number 7. And so, coming in at number 7, we have the Marksman of Care Andros from Gondor. Obviously Gondor are certainly not a faction which is lacking for archers. They have many options in many different fields. But the reason why the Marksmen of Carandros are my favourite is partly down to the changes in point nine seven to archers. Higher tier archers are now very much worth it. They will be, you know, heavily armoured ones like this will very easily be able to dispatch some of the lower tier archers. Of course, it may still be construed as a bit of a waste of ammunition on cannon fodder, but at least now they won't be overwhelmed by the sheer numbers uh, that some of the lower tier archers have. You know, it's very worth your while to invest a little bit more in your archer line if that's indeed the way that you want to approach the battle at hand. Uh, but the re the thing that sets the marks on the Carandros above other archers of this type, uh, for me, uh, is actually nothing to do with their archery, but more with to their skills in melee, because of course they will pull out a two-handed longsword in melee, which means that they are going to be able to dish out a fairly decent amount of damage in melee. A melee attack of 10 is very good for an archer of this type, and of course they back that up by having a pretty decent amount of defensive skill, as you would expect from a unit which two-hands their weapon. Uh, but also the armour of Gondor also buffs the total defence, that's something which Gondor as a whole tends to uh, be able to enjoy. Uh, it comes with its own downsides as well, of course, but for the most part, Gondor's units tend to have high total defence values, which is very good for them. But yeah, it, it really does come down to their abilities in melee, because at range, obviously with a missile attack of 6 and you know a unit count of 124, that's relatively similar to other marksman type units. Most archers of this type kind do tend to be called marksmen after all. Bardian, Balakath, Elvelin. Um, and all of those units are probably better in a skirmish fight overall than the marksman of Carandros, whilst being slightly cheaper even, just because they may not have the higher base armour, but for most of those units you can buff their armour a little bit um, with an armour upgrade, and even if they aren't quite up to the same level as the marksman, they're only one or two uh, points behind them. But Critically, they do have access to a shield, which will make a big difference in a skirmish fight. So compared to those units, perhaps, the Marksman of Carandros are a little bit wanting, even if their damage is the same in a skirmish fight. Uh, but the, the fact that they are good in melee and able to deal a good amount of damage means that if someone thinks you're going to go for a skirmish-heavy build, um, they may try to rush you, uh, which of course means that you're going to have a far more limited amount of time with which to use your archers, provided the rush is good and provided the map allows for that sort of thing. Obviously, it's it's a different it's a different scenario entirely if you're able to funnel your opponent into a choke point. Um, but provided your opponent can sort of get around your lines and wash over you, it can be a little bit of a problem when your archers do get engaged in melee. While most of these marksman units can hold their own in melee, 
few can actually dish, dish out the amount of punishment that the marksman of Care Andros can, and it's one of the reasons why I like them so much, because they can really add to Gondor's already very solid array of infantry, um, and offer a little bit of damage onto the front line as well. So that sort of multi-purpose nature of this unit is why I hold them in higher esteem than even something like the Bardian Marksman, which I really do rate highly as well, um, and maybe you know could be mentioned as an honourable mention. Um, but for me, this is definitely my favourite Gondorian units, um, and this mainly comes down to the changes to archers in point nine seven. I feel. But now we shall move on to number six. So coming in at number six, we have the Seafarers of Nindamos from the Lost Realm of Numenor, and they are, I think, the cheapest unit on this list uh, by fifty florins, I believe. Uh, but you wouldn't think that from the amount of damage they can do in a short amount of time. Obviously, with their missile attack of ten. This makes, individually, their javelins even more punchy than the Atomwall's troll hunters. The problem they do have, of course, is they have a very limited amount of ammunition. Uh, but with the amount of seafarers that you can bring in a single army, that off honestly might not matter so much. And the primary focus of the seafarers of Nindamos is to do a pretty high amount of damage very, very quickly, and then double as pretty decent line infantry as well, pulling out those one-handed axes. Again, much like the Dunedain Peacekeepers that we mentioned earlier, Axe and shield infantry means that they have a little bit more of a focus around dealing damage, of course. As infantry, they are not up to the level of the Dunedain Peacekeepers, but those javelins really do make a big difference. And of course, Numenor in general, uh, one of the things that you will often run into as Numenor is the fact that your armies are probably going to be smaller than your opponents, unless you're facing off against the elves, um, possibly the dwarves as well, depending on how quality heavy they want to go, or other Numenorian based factions, of course. So one thing that you will want to do is try to level the playing field in terms of numbers as quickly as you possibly can. Of course, they can do that via archers, armor-piercing archers at that. But the main event, really, for me, happens when the enemy closes with you and then you can utilize your Seafarers of Nindamos to devastate their front line in terms of their numbers. And then, of course, your very high-tier Romena units are backing up, backed up then by the Seafarers as they charge into melee, can then clean up as suddenly the numbers advantage is now yours, um, and it can be quite difficult to recover from, honestly, if you utilise the Seafarers of Nindamos to their fullest effect. Obviously, the Javelins don't necessarily have to be used in that capacity either, they can also be used to zone out cavalry, and with a missile attack of 10, any cavalry that gets too close is going to regret it very, very quickly. And, again, part of the reason why I like this unit so much is the fact that they are so cheap. You know, relatively speaking, 650 is a real bargain for the amount of damage that they can do. Of course, Numenor have a relatively small roster as well, so to be honest with you, the Seafarers of Nindamos are perhaps one of the most predictable units in the Numenorian roster you're likely to see because of the efficiency you can get with them. Um, but that doesn't really affect how good I feel as though they are. Um, but yeah, I, I feel as though they are a very simple unit again to talk about, because it is primarily down to the fact that you can do such a high amount of damage with them quickly. And then once their javelins are expended, they aren't helpless like some of the other javelins are. For example, if you look at something like the Balchoth Tribesmen, as soon as they're out of ammunition, they're not really that great in melee. Uh, the Seafarers of Nindamos, however, not only do they have a very, very devastating ranged attack, uh, but they are also able to muck in in melee and help some of Numenor's higher tier units as well. Um, but yeah, I think now we'll move on to the top half of the list, starting at number 5. And coming in at number 5, we have the Sindar of the Girdle from Mirkwood, Mirkwood's premier cavalry unit. And the Sindar of the Girdle, for all intents and purposes, are Spear Knights, one of the very few examples of such a unit in the game. And what this essentially means is they're sort of like a happy middle ground between the standard knights that you see with lances, of course, they still have a bonus versus cavalry, uh, but it is not as high as the Sindar of the Girdles. However, the Sindar of the Girdles attack bonus against cavalry is also not as high as melee knights. Um, but of course, the Sindar of the Girdle also sit in a happy middle ground when it comes to their offensive capabilities as well. Albeit with a charge bonus of 20, they, technically speaking, have just as good a charge as you know, sort of lance knights as well. So they get that into the bargain. It's all around you can see where I'm going with this, I think the Sindar of the Girdle basically marry some of the best abilities of melee knights and lance knights. There is a very real case for saying why they should have cracked the top three, which I'll get into in just a moment, especially considering they do actually tend, you know, 1350 uh, is cheaper than the vast array of knights that uh, are on offer from the other factions as well. Um, so pretty good value for money for the most part as well. You know, you, you it's not uncommon to see the Sindar of the Girdle rack up quite incredible kill count 
in a battle just because once they get rolling they are very difficult to stop because they have such good attacking statistics against infantry and units on foot but also the fact that they're so good in melee. One of the problems that you will often run into against the Sindar of the Girdle when trying to stop them with your own cavalry is the fact that they have such a high attack as well as a bonus versus cavalry means they're going to do a lot of damage to your cav in return but also the fact that it's very difficult to land a shot on them because of their high defensive skill. Most of Merkwood's units tend to share in this. Obviously a higher defensive skill means it's going to be much more difficult to land hits on them. Their armor of 10 is honestly not bad for a Merkwood unit either. You know, most Merkwood units, like you know, most Merkwood units in general, tend to be hovering around the 6 to 8 mark. Obviously the Sindar of the Girdle are one of the most elite units in the Merkwood roster, so you'd expect them to have a little bit more than they do. Um, but even so, pretty much everything you could possibly want in addition to being 2, hit, 2 HP as well, like most knights. The one downside to the Sindar of the Girdle, they may have a shield value of 3, and they may have better armour than most Merkwood units, but these are still two areas in which they are significantly worse off than most other cavalry units like this. Obviously, if you compare them to something like the Imladris Knights, or especially the Arthurdain or Runic Knights, they are much, much more vulnerable to arrow fire over an extended period of time and as soon as their hit points are gone it's not going to take much for them to start to uh, to peel away and most people will want to use a unit like this very aggressively because of its strong abilities both off the charge and in melee um, but obviously the downside to doing this is the fact that uh, you know over the long haul attrition can take its toll on the Sindar of the Girdle I think they are actually getting tweaked a little bit as now as well um, in the future to put more of an emphasis I think on their attacking statistics rather than their ability to fight other cavalry so i think they are being slightly retooled um but for the most part i can't see the sindar of the girdle changing too much they will always be this sort of very skillful very deadly unit when it comes to engaging in melee and off the charge even if you know the uh, the overall balancing of how they do that is changed a bit but their weakness will always be extended periods of time whilst under arrow fire, because as soon as their hit points are gone, they will bleed away, which is why they are not the highest ranked cavalry unit on this list, even if when it comes to being aggressive with them and in melee, they probably are. Um, but I think it's time we moved on to number four. And coming in at number four, we have the only artillery piece on this list, and I'm sure anyone who's played Reforge won't be too surprised to learn that it is the Dragon's Breath Flame Cannon that Rune can now field. Don't let those big cannonballs fool you, this is just a more of a placeholder model than anything of the monster bombard from Medieval 2. It doesn't actually fire cannonballs as such, it fires a projectile of pure flame, and it can be absolutely devastating. It's definitely upstaged the Isengard Ballista in the Siege Department for this. It is pinpoint accurate, it is able to deal tons and tons of damage to enemy infantry formations, it is able to do this at a great distance as well, with a lot of range. It's able to outrange, I believe, standard ballistas, um, which is obviously a huge boon for them, because it means that as long as they deploy a little bit further back, they can always have the first shot. Um, and with how accurate the Dragon's Breath Cannon is, as well as how wide the projectile actually is, uh, chances are they will be able to snipe out any ballistas that are trying to do the same to them. However, uh, there are... The one downside to the Dragon's Breath Cannon, to my mind, is the fact that it is not very good at all at attacking buildings. You can see there the attack versus buildings, 85. That's not a lot. Uh, you're going to have to use pretty much the entirety of its ammunition just to knock down a section of wall, uh, which is obviously not the most efficient thing to do. If you're going to do that, you should probably look elsewhere for artillery pieces. This is definitely not a piece of siege equipment which is designed to take down settlements and fortified positions, because, uh, of course, again, projectile of pure flame, not going to be necessarily the best thing at uh, dealing with a big thick stone wall of a castle. The areas where it is brilliant however are on maps where you can set up a good position to shoot into the enemy, preferably if you can get this thing up onto a bit of elevated position and shoot down into the enemy through them as well. Obviously it's able to... the projectile tends to bounce as well so the flames will sort of spread off into uh, into orbit oftentimes because obviously if the projectile hits a hill it often gets angled straight upwards which can be very amusing to see. Uh, but more so than anything, uh, the map type where the Dragon's Breath Cannon can be at its best is a river crossing. Purely because there's very little that the enemy can do uh, when the Dragon's Breath Cannon really gets firing, because obviously they have to defend the crossings to an extent, otherwise you can just pour across it. But of course, if they condense themselves into a defensive formation, the Dragon's Breath Cannon is going to be able to rip through a ton of them. And the size of the projectile is one of the main 
reasons why they are able to do this, and one change that I believe is going to be made in the hotfix when uh, when that does eventually come out is that that will be reduced slightly. So for the time being, the Dragon's Breath Cannon, that could be construed as a nerf, and it is, but I think that is right, because at the moment the Dragon's Breath Cannon is able to deal a lot of damage even when the opponent is dealing with it in the correct way. Um, and I, I feel as though that it's only right that the Dragon's Breath Cannon should be subject to the same weaknesses as a lot of other sieges, in that if you spread out and keep your units in sort of long formations where it can't rip through huge amounts of you, uh, you shouldn't be overly punished for that, which considering the size of the projectile at the minute is maybe a little bit over the top. Um, really the only siege equipment that should be able to do well in that sort of situation would be the Hwatcher from the Shire and the Khand. Um, but the Dragon's Breath Cannon, even with those nerfs, it will still be, I think, my personal favourite uh, piece of siege equipment in the game. Because I can't really see it being nerfed hard enough to the point where it becomes less desirable to bring for rune in those situations but of course there are limitations uh, don't bring it if you're trying to knock down walls because it won't necessarily work um, and also if you do find yourself in a more open area where the enemy isn't just going to sit back and they are going to come forwards very relatively quickly to try and shut you down it can be quite difficult because obviously then your own men will start getting in the way and suddenly the dragon's breath is going to look like a bit of a waste of money but if you use it right it can really be a match winner for rune uh, and it's something new and unique for them because obviously most of their roster has been complete for a long time, so it's nice for Room to get something a little bit new and uh, new and different. Uh, but without further ado, let's move on to the top three. And coming in at number three, we have the Moraquendi Glade Lords of Dorwinian, the Knights from the Vale of Dorwinian, to be more specific. And this was a close run thing, honestly. It was either this unit here or the Gwaith Eroctor from Imladris that I was considering. And honestly, again, this is another area, much like the Dunedain Peacekeepers and honestly sent several other units on this list, um, that you could make a very real case for saying that the Gwaithi Rock Door are just straight up better um, with Imladris' general focuses, especially with the backup that the Gwaithi Rock Door can get when you consider the other anti-cavalry options that Imladris have on horseback. It can certainly make their cavalry lineup, while expensive, incredibly scary to go up against, whereas Dorwinian's is much more high risk um, than Imladris is, certainly. If you combine the Glade Lords with the Nandor Glade Riders, you suddenly have a bunch of cavalry units that have a charge bonus of 20, but especially in the Glade Riders, you have some very fragile units. In comparison, however, to the Sindar of the Girdle that we saw previously, the Glade Lords have a few things going for them. They actually have lower armor, but the shield is a significant step up. The defensive skill is obviously very nice. Hit points of 2, charge bonus of 20, attack of 8. Very standard fare when it comes to knights, obviously, again, effective against armor, frightened nearby infantry, bonus fighting cavalry, knights, you know, their list of accolades goes on and on and on, um, and I've obviously called them the battlefield kings in the past, and that still very much applies in 0.97, while there are certainly more options to try and shut them down with regards to javelins or the buffs to spears, obviously the same ones that existed previously, such as crossbows and pikes, if you get into a good position, but if you get rolling with a unit of knights, the amount of devastation you can cause is significant, and the reason why the Glade Lords are at the top is purely because of all the Elven Knight units, I do like them the best. And this may have something to do, again, sort of they are the new hotness, as it were, like a, a you know, bit of a bit of bias with regards to that. Obviously, they're a new unit. Everyone likes new stuff. Um, and like I said, the Gwaithi Rock Door, you could make a case for saying why they are better than the Glade Lords in all these ways. The Horse Lords of Ulmo, I would say, again, they have, they're faster, I believe, or at the very least, they feel faster to use. Uh, but obviously the main drawback to the Horse Lords of Ulmo is the fact they have even lower armour and they have no shields at all. So again, much like the Sindar of the Girdle, after a period of time, attrition can really start to take its toll. But the shields on the Glade Lords certainly mitigate that somewhat. Um, and just their elven nature. Like, similar with the Sindar of the Girdle, if you get into a fight, a straight-up fight with the Moraquendi Glade Lords, their defensive skill and their damage as elves can just make them so, so difficult to kill. Um, and for the most part, you really don't want to be taking a straight-up fight with elven cavalry. Um, and the Moraquendi Glade Lords are certainly no exception to that. And they really have to be that juggernaut in the Darwinian Cavalry. Because the other cavalry units, the Stalkers and the Glade Riders, while they are both strong in their own right, they don't have the, the stuff, the solidity, to really stand up 
for as long as many of the other elven cavalry forces, but the Glade Lords most certainly do. And it's the fact they have to take on this workload and the fact that they can be successful at it that just pushes the Glade Lords ahead of the Gwythi Rock Door for me. If this came down to pure looks, I would still give it to the Gwythi Rock Door, to be honest with you. Um, but not to say the Glade Lords look bad with their uh, their sort of thorned vine style glaives um, and their sort of their purple colour scheme. I do very much like that. Um, but it's to use that the Morikwendi Glade Lords. I've seen them used effectively too much uh, to ignore them, I think. Uh, but now we shall move on to number two. And at number two, we have what many people, I think, will probably be seeing as a bit of a surprise. We have the Shield Maidens of Rohan, and this is for a few reasons. Um, and a lot of it comes down to Rohan as a faction, honestly. Of course, the Shield Maidens are very good in their role, but it's the fact that they fit so well into Rohan's armies to both, you know, enhance their strengths and make up for their weaknesses in many ways um, that really pushes them this high on the list, because the Shield Maidens, in my experience playing as Rohan in point nine seven, which... All things considered, Rohan probably should have been one of those factions which maybe wasn't so fortunate in point nine seven. with obviously the buffs to Spears in particular. Their cavalry focus should have maybe seen them uh, fall a little bit further down. They have good Spears of their own, of course, but cavalry was always meant to be their thing. And of course, one major gap that Rohan has always had throughout all of Third Age, way back to vanilla, is the fact that they have had no phalanx units. They have had nothing that can form Spear Wall, um, and obviously... This can be a big problem for them in an infantry fight because it means that they can essentially be held at arm's length if it comes down to a pure melee scrap. While their infantry, as I've said before, um, most people I think underestimate Rohan's infantry. While it certainly isn't the primary focus of the faction, it can certainly be made to work, especially if you bring a lot of their higher tier units. They can do a lot of damage, especially to armoured factions with their two-handed axemen. But, obviously, the thing that most players assume when going into battle against Rohan is, well, I can just get some cheap pikes in the centre of my infantry, and then their infantry will just be nullified. And then all I really need to worry about is their cavalry coming around and shooting me from behind or charging me from behind in the worst cases. The Shield Maidens, however, are pretty much the perfect answer to enemy phalanx units. Now, I was quite worried, actually, for axe throwers in point nine seven when I heard they were losing their armour-piercing but gaining... A bunch of base damage I was concerned that this would defang them a little bit um, and would make them too easy to counter now they are certainly easier to counter than javelins because you know you can just send some shielded heavily armored line infantry to try and absorb their fire and it will work unlike javelins who will still rip right through those units but the amount of damage you can potentially do to unshielded units with axe throwers like this is extreme um, the missile attack of 12 puts them ahead of units in terms of base damage, even you know the mighty seafarers, which I was on about how devastating they can be. Now if you imagine the shield mains of Rohan against the right kind of units can not only be more damaging, but they can keep up that amount of pressure for a longer period of time with their better ammunition. Very, very nice indeed. Um, and obviously this means that a infantry focused Rohan build is very much possible because no longer will a block of pikes be enough to simply stop you from advancing because Halberds and pikes alike will run in fear from the shield veins with the amount of damage they can do. And then there's, of course, the utility that you have on the battlefield with axe throwers, because not only can they be used against phalanx units, but their high damage can also be used against other forms of infantry. Much like archers, if you do hit shielded, heavily armoured infantry in the back, it will still do a ton of damage to them. And they're not afraid of mucking in in melee either. With a total defense of 20, that is very high. A very nice defensive skill, honestly, for a unit of this type of 6. Their armor is decent, their shield is okay. It means that they're not going to be, you know, armor and shield. There is room for improvement there, but obviously, you know, it just means that they're not going to be devastated by archers super fast. It's still a weakness of theirs, um, but even so, again. They're able to just fill that role so well, and in my experience, I just feel as though the shield mains of Rohan fit so nicely into the Rohan roster, and just give you a lot more tactical flexibility as Rohan. You know, you don't have to just go for just a boatload of horse archers and lancers and just run away from your enemy all day long until they're weak enough for you to charge in with your lancers and crush them. You know, Rohan do have more going for them than that, and I feel as though the shield mains are a huge part of that with the amount of damage you can do with them. They are not, however, my favourite unit from point nine seven. That honour belongs to another unit, and we'll get on to number one right now. And so, number one, and my favourite unit in point nine seven up to this point, the Kindred of Caliborn from Lothlorien, one of the specialty archers that Lothlorien is able to bring to the field. And 
Lothlorien, I feel like, in 0.96.1 really were the ugly duckling of elven factions. Like, the other three all had something that really set them apart. Lothlorien, meanwhile, were kind of this middle ground between all three, where they weren't amazing at any one thing. They were still a very good faction, don't get me wrong, but they didn't have anything unique and a real selling point uh, to play them. Now, however, that has completely changed with their vast array of archers, and I would, I would say with some confidence, honestly, that they are the strongest archer faction in patch 0.97 because they're able to go for skirmish fights, they're able to go for, you know, they're able to utilize their poison arrows to break units and factions. They've got a very, very powerful horse archer as well, which is probably the best horse archer, certainly the best horse archer from a ranged perspective in the game. Um, there are a few others that you could say uh, are a be bit better all around, maybe. Um, but what really sets them apart is their unique projectiles. You know, poison arrows, of course, is something which is shared um, with some of the other factions, even the Silver Thorns from their other high tier units, the Watchers of the Golden Wood on foot, are shared more or less with some of the other Elven factions in Imladris and Mirkwood. But the Kindred of Caliborn are utterly unique with their ammunition, and that is, of course, their split shot ammunition. You know, Missile Attack of Six is relatively mundane, you may think, for an archer of this type, especially considering that even the basic Loran Armed Archers have a Missile Attack of Eight. But the fact is that they have effectively each shot loses three arrows when it splits into three in flight. I'm not entirely sure how the maths works, but assuming uh, the missile attack of six is applied to each one, uh, that of course means that there is a total of 18 potential damage which is going down range for each arrow that is loose. That is a huge potential bonus. Uh, but of course, you know, the other two shots that are fired are not necessarily as accurate as the first, so there is a bit of spread here. They're not all pinpoint accurate. One arrow will be as accurate as any Elven Archer will be. The other two will, of course, have a little bit of uh, spread on that. But too often as have I seen the Kindred of Caliborn just rip a single unit, especially of unshielded infantry, to, to absolute shreds uh, quickly for me to not love them, honestly. Um, and they really do set Lothlorien apart in the Arch game, to be honest with you, because whereas a lot of their other units, you know, there are equivalents in the other Elven factions, the Kindred of Caliborn are what really sets Lothlorien apart from the others when it comes to their archers. Perhaps one area where you could say there is a little bit of room for improvement is the fact that they are dual wielders, which, you know, honestly, like a dual wielding unit, they have a huge amount of defensive skill at 22. Um, but honestly, you know, most people would probably prefer the additional damage because generally speaking, additional defensive skill just means they'll be able to stand and fight for slightly longer um, rather than doing the additional damage. But it's, it's me trying to pick holes here and trying to find downsides in the Kindred of Caliborn, to be honest with you because obviously they're still going to be absolutely devastating in melee once their ammunition has been expended. Um, and yeah, like, as far as an archer goes, the Kindred of Caliborn are absolutely my favourite in patch 0.97, and indeed, they are my favourite unit in 0.97. I'm just glad now that Lothlorien has their own identity. Obviously, you could say that they've stolen Mirkwood's Thunder a little bit by having, you know, the mantle of, like, the best elven archers sort of conferred upon them rather than Mirkwood. But I would say that Merc would have certainly gained enough in terms of, you know, armor upgrades and, you know, the Ents are obviously one factor that they certainly have going for them, that it doesn't really bother them too much. Um, but yeah, certainly the Kindred of Caliborn able to nail down the number one spot in my favorite units in 0.97. So that's that with my top 10 favourite units in 0.97. As it stands, of course, the hotfix is likely to change a few things around, but certainly with regards to the order, I think maybe the, you know, the fact that the Dragon's Breath will be taking what is, I think, going to be a slight nerf might mean that they drop a place or two. Um, but for the most part, I honestly can't see that changing too much until, you know, obviously other factions are added, like Ered, Luin, and Dol Guldur are still quite a long ways off, um, but they are still a factor which will probably play into any future lists like this. Uh, but it is worth saying as well that this is not really an objective list as such. It's a very subjective one, um, with my opinion. Um, and like I said, there are several of these units which you could say there are sort of objectively better units which could have slotted into those positions. Like I said, the Glade Lord, you could very easily say the Gwythi Rock Door should have occupied that spot for Imladris. But personally, I prefer the Glade Lords just because of what they can offer Dorwinian as a faction, whereas Imladris, you know, Imladris haven't really changed all that much, and that might be a bit of a new stuff bias which is going on for me there um, and also stuff like the Dunedain Peacekeepers there are certainly better units of line infantry in the game but again like I said what I think they offer Arthurdain um, in conjunction with a lot of other Arthurdain strengths and being a very balanced faction is very useful and like I've said I can only speak from experience and from experience the Peacekeepers have always been a very damaging unit and have always more than paid for themselves as long as they haven't just been focused down by ranged units from the start 
Uh, a few honourable mentions, though, I would certainly say that the Parathil champions from Dole Amroth can probably count themselves to be a little bit unfortunate not to be included. Um, it was between them and the Peacekeepers who was going to get the number 10 spot, honestly. Um, but I've seen the Peacekeepers... Um, honestly, I've not really seen the Peacekeepers perform badly up to this point. I have seen the Parathil champions struggle on occasion. Uh, the main selling point behind them, though, is, of course, the fact that they cause fear. Um, and I believe part of the hotfix is going to make two-handed sword units like them a little bit more viable, uh, make them a little bit stronger across the board. Um, you know, Elven, human, orc, dwarf, regardless, if that's the kind of unit it is, it's going to get a slight buff. So that might be enough, honestly, to send the Parathil up into 10 above the Peacekeepers, but we shall see. Um, another one, of course, would be the Bardian Marksman, I think, from Dale. They're a very, very good unit of skirmishing archers, you know, heavily armoured when you upgrade them to their full lamella, um, and then they're also pretty good line infantry when all is said and done. But honestly, I think I could stand here and talk about units all day, like there's other ones as well, like obviously the Gwaith Eroktor, the Gwaith Mirdain even, are very strong units of uh, bodyguard tier line infantry. The Witchers are ever a uh, controversial unit. There's obviously the Blacklock Engineers, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but again, it's it's a subjective list, this, and I'm sure that everyone will have their favourites as well. Um, but do feel free to uh, leave in the comments what your top three units are that you've seen so far in point nine seven because there's such a wide array at this point. And obviously Reforge has come a long way since the early days of the mod. There's now so much in the game that it's kind of hard to do uh, these lists where I do top tens or top fives because there's so much that it's, it's kind of hard to collate everything. Um, when it's my opinion like this, it's a little bit easier. Uh, but yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed this one. It's obviously been quite a while since I've done a top 10, so it's a bit of a return to form there. And like I said, I'm not sure what my schedule is going to be, but there is actually a very real chance that my schedule could actually open up a little bit more and I could get back to doing one video every two days. We shall see. Um, again, I'm very tentative about that because I don't want to promise something that I can't deliver on. Um, but still, like there will be regular content from now on, I believe. You know, I should be able to find days where I can do recording in big blocks, um, and then I can just sort of piece it out throughout uh, the following weeks. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you'll join me for whatever is next.